So tonight I have not one, but I have two licensed mental health clinicians. So at first we're going to bring in a new friend of mine, Masi De Camara. How you doing, Masi? I'm good, Dean. How are you? Good. It's Dakamara. Sorry. No problem. All right. And also joining us tonight, we have a little bit of an older friend, somebody that I used to work at, at uh, a local high school with, Meg Kennedy, who's also a licensed mental health clinician. Hey, Meg. Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? All right. Well, I'm excited to have you both. Masi, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do and what you and how you practice? Sure. I am the owner of Be Inspired Counseling. We have offices in both Stoughton and Mansfield. It's a group private practice consisting of 13 clinicians. So we treat everyone from ages five up through adults, focusing on mental health and substance use issues. I'm trying to give a lot of good into the community with some special projects that we work with. Um, we are helping in the schools, just general education and support to both clients and the communities. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Meg. Hi. Um, Hi. In addition to um, my full-time job as a school adjustment counselor, I also have a private practice. Um, it is just me as the um, solitary clinician, and it's very part-time as I am full-time in the school. Um, but I treat clients um, from ages 14 to roughly 55. Um, and with issues ranging from anxiety, ADHD, depression to substance use issues um, or, you know, familial family dynamic type issues. So wide range. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. So I have to ask you both, and I'll, I'll start with Masi first. The pandemic, has that increased your business? Has it decreased your business? What are some of the challenges that you faced? It's definitely increased our business. We are all packed. Everybody has picked up extra cases. You know, we're, we're maintaining a wait list. We wish we could take everybody off as quickly as possible. But the, the need and demand for services are so high right now that all, the, all providers, I think, are, are full. Um, and it's, I've never seen anything like this before, how, how busy we are. And just everyone is just jam packed all day, every day. We, you know, clients who we were seeing every other week are now coming in weekly. Some of our weekly clients are now coming in twice a week. Just people are, have really been struggling. So we've just been just going, going, going to give people as many people the support that we can. Unfortunately, wish we could take everybody, but it's, there's not enough help to go around for everybody. It's really quite sad. Really? And so we'll get back to that, too, about the size of your operation. Meg, same question. Yes. So there's definitely been a major increase in the need for mental health clinicians um, due to the pandemic and the, the all the anxiety and depression and isolation that has come along with it. I mm -hmm. think people are, the, the positive is that people are reaching out for support. However, the supply is exceeding the demand. I mean, the, de the demand is it backwards. The demand is exceeding the supply. So the, the, the amount of clinicians just can't, can't handle the need right now. And so that's a major issue. I know I'm in my practice turning people away because I don't have the availability to take anyone new at this time. And the people that I'm referring to other clinicians are also finding that they're subject to wait lists and having difficulty finding anyone that's taking new clients right now. So just so I can get a feel for what, you, what you're both working with, Masi, how big is your operation? So we have 13 clinicians and we have 11 clinical offices that go. So there are nights where we've got 11 clinicians working, seeing four, five, six clients a night. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Our volume's pretty high. Meg? Well, in my practice, it's just me, and I only work two evenings a week um, due to, you know, the need of my family and, and my services there. So sure. I'm either completely full and unable to take anyone, or I have very specific openings, like 6 o'clock on Mondays. Um, 
so it's it's kind of challenging to to find you know what works for everybody so this sounds like this is, might be really problematic for people that are newly diagnosed or somebody or or maybe not even diagnosed somebody who just knows that they need more but they can't quite figure out what it is so what are you doing now you said that you you're referring people but how is that being received when somebody you know, builds up the courage because I think it takes courage to admit that you might need to talk to somebody and then they come to you and you're not able to take them on, Masi. So uh, so how does that been going for you? So we call everybody back, which I think a lot of practices don't call everybody back, but we call everyone who calls us or emails us, we call back, you know, we get their information. We're pretty realistic about what we think our time frame is, mm -hmm. um, but that we can't guarantee anything if people, you know, does it leave or someone has an opening or, you know, we move people as when we can, but we also work with them to help them, you know, find a group. If we can, we're going to be running a group soon too. So we're hoping to flood some people into that or giving them names of agencies or other local practices or helping them find self-help tools or things that they can do while they're waiting. Um, we encourage people to get on as many wait lists as possible. I think a lot of the problem is lots of people want after school hours and unfortunately, especially now with kids going back to school full time, those don't exist as much as they were. So we it, it have makes more sense. appointment time. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely hard to fit people in. We're asking people if they can talk to their school adjustment counselors or their pediatric social workers and their pra pediatric practices like in an interim, just trying to help them find something while they're waiting to come in. Sure. sure. Meg, are you running into some of the same issues? Yes, I always get back to everybody that reaches out um out of courtesy and and you know try to offer them a list of local providers that they can attempt to call um it the the challenge is also that a lot of people would prefer in-person counseling they're just more comfortable with it and it is really challenging to find anyone that is accepting new clients in person. Um, most treatment is being conducted virtually at this point, just for convenience and safety purposes. Um, so that is a barrier that, that I'm seeing. Sure. Now, as far as contact and building a connection, um, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people can, you know, can probably surmise that your business is based around being a great listener mm -hmm. and building connections with people in a very small amount of time. What are some of the challenges you faced as far as be, being able to build a connection via Zoom? You know, like like even with this right here, and you and I've met both of you before. It still doesn't have that same personal touch and feel that a uh, that an in person meeting would have. So, what do you what are you doing? How are you bridging that gap, Masi? So we're doing a couple of different things. Um, we do we are bringing back people slowly in person, but for our clients on telehealth, we do a lot of like telehealth games. We'll screen share. We'll teach skills that way. Um, and we're also dropping off kits at people's homes. So especially for our younger and our teen clients, we're making a kit of the activity for the week and we're literally driving around or mailing them to people's homes. So they have the same materials the clinician will have and we can still interact and do something rather than just sitting and staring at each other. Positive of the Zoom that we use Doxy, but whatever the system is, is we've been able to see people's homes and say, so show me in your room where, in your house where your safe place is. Show me your favorite stuffed animal. Show okay. me what gives you comfort. So we've been able to do a lot of that, which we can't do when they're in the office. Um, so that's been one of the positives for us. But we're just trying to be as creative as we possibly can. I'd say that's pretty creative. I, I, I can definitely see how being able to just get a, a visual picture of where people, you know, like, you know, obviously your clients that come in, they talk about things that happen at home, I'd imagine, quite a bit. And being able to kind of get a layout of the land, it always helps you understand, you know, what people are seeing and how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So I can see that. So how about you, Meg? Are you doing anything to help build connections with your clients? Yes. So fortunately, because my in, within my practice, you know, I'm, I'm limited with the amount of clients that I see. And many of them, fortunately, have, have been long-term clients of mine. So we already had the connection prior to COVID. So that worked in my favor. Um, it is more challenging to build a connection, you know, initially through, through a camera. Um, I find that 
being able to read body language and facial expressions and just pick up on someone's energy is a very important part of my job. Um, and the virtual aspect of that is is limiting in that way. Um, however, it the option for virtual counseling has opened a lot of doors for people in terms of flexibility and access to treatment, which is a huge positive um, that, you know, COVID did give us that because it wasn't so mainstream prior to that. That, that makes sense. Now, do you see yourself maybe instituting some sort of a hybrid program now that you now that you know there are the and again everybody calls it Zoom. It's like anything else. Like if you call like people call every soda a Coke, you know what I mean? Whatever gets there first is what people kind of call it. So now that we have this Zoom ability, do you see yourself going to a hybrid model, Mossy? Will that work better for your business? So that's kind of at the mercy of the insurance companies because mm -hmm. right now insurance companies are covering the online services, but they're not guaranteeing they're always gonna do it. So if clients have insurance and their company and their policies won't pay for it, that limits what we're able to do. Makes sense. So, Meg, being a one-stop shop, what do you think? Yes, um, it's similar to Marcy, at the moment I'm offering kind of what works for you. If you prefer virtual, then we can do virtual. If you wanna come into the office, I am seeing clients in person. Um, so, it, you know, and it's been working because certain clients might say, I, I won't be able to get there by this time. Can we do a virtual session instead? And I'm able to accommodate that. Um, but again, it, it's kind of at the mercy of the insurance companies moving forward and seeing how long they'll continue to cover it. All right. Outstanding. So we do have a couple questions in the chat. So Carol just wants you to shout out the names of your, uh, your businesses again. So Mossy. What's the name of your company? Uh, we, I am I am the owner of Be Inspired Counseling. We're based out of Stoughton and Mansfield. All right. Meg? And I am the owner and sole operator of MK Wellness, which is based out of Canton. All right. So there you go, Carol. Uh, Mike wants to know, with a higher need for mental health professionals and what sounds like a lack of help, how do we answer the, to the call that for the need for mental health professionals assisting with law enforcement? So, Masi, any thoughts on that mental health assistant with, with uh, the police department? I think it's I think it's very important. I'm always happy to collaborate with any group. I'd be happy to sit and, and to chat at any point in time. You know, I for me, I I have the luxury of kind of having a balance in my day where I have some administrative time and some client time. So I I love I personally love going around. I've done stuff with the schools and being able to go around and consult with different groups. So. I'm more than happy to, you know, chat with anybody at any time to give support, especially to law enforcement, because I know you guys have seen a lot of it. Yeah. That's a great answer. Meg? Yes. Um, I echo Marcy's sentiments there, and I would be happy to collaborate with law enforcement at any time. If, if the question is um, geared more towards the idea of mental health professionals accompanying law enforcement, um, I know that that has been thrown out there in various states and cities or, you know, over time um, that, you know, obviously sounds like it would require a dedicated professional that that was their role. Um, and so that would kind of be a difference, kind of a little bit different there. Um, mm -hmm. So but I, I definitely think it's a need. And for mental health and law enforcement to collaborate and, and try to assist people um, that are having those challenges. I agree. It's definitely something that um, it's going to take a little work figuring out the exact balance because you have a contingency of people out there that want to eliminate law enforcement from the equation altogether. And I can tell you right now, anything that can reduce the call volume would be fine by most of us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If it's calls that we said, hey, you don't have to handle any of this category of call anymore, that would be fine. Because at the end of the day, there's so much of this going on that we're getting pulled away from doing law enforcement. Like we do so many things now that aren't law, that's not law enforcement based anymore. You know, it's based on, you know, where we're, we're we're uh, guidance counselors, we're clinicians. People expect us to know, be able to look at somebody within 10 seconds, being able to figure out exactly what it is they're, uh, they're suffering from or they're feeling. So I know that a lot of police officers would be more than happy to give some of these calls up, 
But the flip side of that coin is a lot of times when we are called, it is for somebody that's in crisis and it's something that um, their loved ones usually that call, it's beyond something that they can handle. Mm -hmm. So would you feel comfortable going to these calls by yourself? So I'll go to you. I'll go back to uh, Meg and then I'll go back to Marcy. So what do you think, Meg? Would you be comfortable going to these houses by yourself? By yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because I I wouldn't know what I was walking into because mm -hmm. someone could present a certain way um, or a family member could present the situation in one way over the phone and there's no one that can really assess what is actually happening there and whether it's, you know, safe for somebody who is not um, trained and able to manage a potentially volatile situation to kind of walk in and not know what they're walking into. That's a great answer. Masi? I, I would have said the same thing. I mean, people, law enforcement tends to walk in, you know, as a pair, because, you know, mm -hmm. you always want somebody having your back as much as you can, and it, it would be no different for us. We get calls all the time. Even people call asking to be seen, and they say they're presenting with anxiety, but when we get them in the office, it's really something else, that that's what they told us was their reason for referral, and it's not it's not always as black and white as we think it is. So we want to keep everybody safe. And if it's an unsafe situation, I might not be the best person to keep that person safe. It's a delicate balance mm -hmm. because a lot of times, um, regardless of what somebody's feeling of affliction wise, whatever that may be, if they're violent, violence is still violence, regardless of what the mental state is or what somebody's um, suffering from or what medications they did or did not take. A knife is still a knife. If they pick up a blunt object, it's still a blunt object. A fist is still a fist. So it's interesting when people expect police officers to not use force against somebody who's using force, regardless of what their mental state is. Because you can't, as I'm sure you know better than anybody, people that are in uh, a very an excited state, you can't you can't reason with them. In fact, you have a lesser chance of being able to de-escalate with somebody who's just not themselves and not feeling or if they're so deep into whatever it is they're suffering from that um they're not their reality isn't really um i don't know how to i don't know what's the best way to put it is but their sense of reality might not be on point so just food for thought out there for that any any thoughts on that at all yeah i mean i think that walking into a situation whether you know it, it might be a situation where somebody has mental health issues and they did not take medication or they're, mm -hmm. they, they've, you know, a situation has prompted, um, you know, dissociation from reality or delusions or hallucinations. They may be responding to internal stimuli that you're not aware of that is, would cause them to be violent or act out. So there's all those factors that have to be considered and mental health professionals as like alone are not prepared to walk into a situation like that without assistance. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Masi, do you I, seem like you want to jump in there? She, she makes it exactly what I was going to say, you know, and yeah. it's, it's anybody who's escalated, whether it's in a law enforcement call or at home or mm -hmm. in a school, anybody adults, you know, when anybody's like, sitting up here there's no having a conversation until someone's de-escalated so if the if the escalated situation is unsafe safety trumps all right we're all in agreement so carol's back carol says there should be a hybrid model for elderly and disabled clients and those with transportation issues so there are actually there are programs for people with transportation issues. There's um, a form called the PT1 form that is covered by Medicaid and a cab will actually or whatever it is now will come and pick you up and take you to your appointment. But there are also teams that do in home services and go to the home. Um, that is their sole job. Meg and I aren't two of those practices that do that. But there are tons of practices who it's called IHT and they go it's in home therapy. So there there are certainly ways to get that as well. All right. All right, so D says, all right, so she apologizes for logging a little late. No problem. Nobody's going to uh, going to make you stay after for detention for that. It says, it's been my experience that MassHealth has a different 
and a difficult criteria for, for providers to follow. So ultimately, low-income clients that have Medicaid and Mass Health are left with longer wait times and sitting in emergency departments. So do you have any experience with that? Like maybe people with, with uh, some of the, I, I hate that maybe lower tiered insurance um, plans aren't getting the, the help they need and maybe they need it the most. So I'll go to you first, Masi. So different agencies take different insurances. There are some that take private. There are some that don't take insurance at all. Um, I've found that bigger agencies tend to take Mass Health and Medicaid. Um, and also Medicaid's fun interesting because like neither Meg or I can take Medicaid. You have to be a social worker to take Medicaid. That's one of Medicaid's rules. Um, hmm. Yeah, right. So, I mean, they don't even like allow us to try to take it. But larger agencies tend to take Mass Health. Um, and there are quite a few larger agencies around here. There's a, a number in Quincy um, that do, do take it. Um, you know, I think as far as emergency wait times, I think everybody is in the same boat. Anytime I, we send someone for a crisis in an emergency, I think it's the same wait time. I think when they're searching for hospitalization beds for people, it doesn't really matter what insurance you have. It's really based on what you're presenting with and if it's a fit for the unit that they have. Um, I think everyone is struggling no matter what insurance they have. I think there's just, there's wait times in general, but it's, it's kind of looking at the, finding the right location that takes it. Psychology Today is a great source because you can plug in exactly what insurance you have into the criteria and that will help you narrow down your your focus search a little bit all right well that's something that I, i'm not sure a lot of people even know that do you, is that common knowledge because that's the first i'm hearing of that it, i think it ebbs and flow as to how common it is but if you look up psychologytoday.com it's it's really a great resource because you, you can type in what town you're in or you're looking at what your insurance is what type of clinician you want if you want male or female mm -hmm. um what your issues are and then it will narrow the scope down for you. Our therapists are heroes. And I definitely feel that they are the unsung heroes of society right now, because again, mental health is through the roof. And it's the type of thing in my day job, it's not something that I am an expert in. It's not something that other uh, people that are in the emergency business are necessarily experts in, including the emergency rooms. Again, they're, they're there for like a lot of physical mental stuff. We need clinicians and we need them to, to be there for us. We need them to be there for, um, with all the other citizens and as you've heard earlier they need to be there for each other so moving on from there so meg let me ask you this when you are dealing with the it, well i should say as far as dealing with teens versus adults does it the, the symptoms tend to manifest themselves the same way like how are you how do you triage that situation or, or are there differences in dealing with teens versus adults how you uh how you well, work with them. Definitely, definitely a difference um, because although teenagers may look like adults and be considered adults, even at 18, um, they still developmentally do not have the insight typically and um, ability to regulate their emotions as well as adults, although mm -hmm. some adults have difficulty with that also. Um, However, it's more common for adolescents to, you know, need assistance navigating that. And so in particular, what a lot of people who aren't in the field, and I, I assume I know that you know this, Dean, from your from your role and um, how we initially met in the school, mm -hmm. that oftentimes teenagers with anxiety or depression or other mental health issues may present as angry, oppositional um, teenagers. And they may be yelling and swearing and fighting and all of this stuff. And people will just attribute it to, oh, he's just, you know, a punk or she's just, you know, having a tantrum. And there's really an underlying mental health issue going on, but they just present more with irritability. Not all, some. And, and we, we look at that as kind of externalizing their emotions as opposed to internalizing. Well, uh, let me ask you, and, I'll, and I'll, I guess I'll throw this question out to Masi. How can we tell the difference? So if you're not in your line of work, how can we tell the difference between someone who's just acting out and someone who, who's suffering? Because, I mean, let's face it, not everybody is has your expertise. And quite frankly, not everybody has the patience to, to sit there and try to figure out which is which. So what do you think, Masi? 
you need to ask the questions because it's, it's what's underlying. So if you just, it's like you can't judge a book by its cover. So you need to really ask the questions to find out what's going on. And no one's going to say to you right off the bat, this is what it is, because they're not going to trust you. So you need to develop that relationship with people. Lots of times parents will say to me, is, you know, you've seen my kid four times, are they done? And I'll say, we're just, we're still getting to know each other. I'm, I'm a stranger. Four times isn't even four hours that I've, I've spent with this person. So it's really building rapport, you know, getting to know the person first so they can open up and tell you. That's and again, perfect answer in a perfect world. But as I'm sure you can imagine, I know, like, again, it's from a law enforcement standpoint, standpoint, by the time we're involved, that means that something got out of hand to the point where somebody felt they needed us to be there. Mm -hmm. So we don't always have the time to do what you're talking about. And again, I don't know if it's fair to ask, um, I'll say a normal person, somebody who's not doing what you do, not doing what I do, to devote this amount of time to seek some sort of understanding when somebody might be throwing a tantrum in their store and destroying things. I mean, somebody might be uh, in a classroom, completely disrupting a classroom and making it impossible for the other 20 or 30 kids in, in that classroom to learn. So it's a delicate balance, I I, I believe. I think it's uh, it's one of those things where it's, I mean, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. Uh, it's just the type of thing where we all have to kind of understand each other and and be mindful of the fact that uh, that these things affect people differently. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and I, I, I'll say that I think with, children and teenagers um, and, and possibly even adults, I think that the general assumption should be if somebody is behaving in that manner that there isn't necessarily or an, an underlying mental health issue, there could be, but there's definitely something going on with them that, that isn't working. So, they're responding to something that they're struggling with and it's coming out behaviorally. So now in saying that, we can understand that, but we don't, it's not an excuse. You can't behave badly, you know, and disrupt a class or destroy property or, you know, that we don't have to, to excuse that behavior, but we can understand it. That's, wow. Okay. The, the A plus on that answer. That was okay. You sh it was so good. It shut me up. I didn't know what to say. That was, that was excellent. Marty, do you have a response or a volley for that? I don't, I don't have a volley by any means. I certainly agree with what Meg is saying. I think sometimes, you know, we, where we don't have time, just saying, you know, I'm sorry to see that you're struggling. Just kind of laying it out there that you're acknowledging that it's, there's something going on. All right. Fair enough. So Kevin, Kevin's back again. He says, as a clinician, if you could change one thing about the mental health system, what would it be? More beds, more services, better insurance coverage, et cetera. More services. I mean, right now, that's what we need. We need more providers who are willing and able to do the job. I think the other part, too, is that, you know, lot, lots of providers treat teens and adults, um, but we also get calls for five and six-year-olds and not I have a large team, but not everybody here is qualified to see five and six year olds, just like not everybody is qualified to see people with substance abuse or anxiety disorder. So it's it's really, you know, the clinicians all to get those extra skills. We need time to take the trainings, but everyone's struggling right now to find the time to take the trainings because we're all doing the work. So it's, you know, it's really just find more people who who want to join the field, either as mental health counselors or licensed social workers to to join us. Meg? Great um, answer, Marcy. Go yes. on, Meg. I agree with Marcy in the need for more services. I I also on the flip side would like to see the mental health profession try to treat the the root cause of the issue rather than treating the symptoms. Because I think that we our culture within medicine and mental health mm -hmm. tends to treat the symptoms rather than trying to get to the root of the issue. And why do you think that is? Is it just because it's easier or? Do we really want to get into this? No. Um, <laughs> you, you went down this rabbit hole, so I'm, I'm coming with you. Go ahead. Give me a little, I, give me a little more. I, I think it's, you know, 
quick fixes. People want the easy way out. They want a quick fix that, ha that you know, oftentimes is pharmaceutical. Um, you know, it, it being able to remedy symptoms through taking medication is, is oftentimes a lot less work than actually buckling down, changing your lifestyle, um, facing, you know, tr trauma that may be at the root of the issue. So there, there's kind of a lot that goes into it, but I think our society, the fast paced, you know, state of our society is like quick fixes. Let's just, you know, do this quickly. I have to get to work. I have to be here. I have to be there. I don't have time for this type of situation. All right. I'm going to ask Marcy the same question, but I'm going to ask it a different way. Marcy, is, is the money in the fix or the cure? So in other words, is it fixing like the little, the, the symptoms or is it actually curing the entire thing? You think that's p playing a role in, in why people tend to focus more on the symptoms? I, I think it's, it's, it's both. I think it, you know, it really depends on what we're presented with. I think I agree. I think a lot, of, I agree with Megan in some ways. I think a lot of people do come in for the quick fix because they want to feel better. And then other things pop up, like there's an, a family event or a sporting event or practice or something or, or homework, or they want to go out with their friends and then therapy becomes a back seat until there's a crisis. And then it's their back, their back, their back, their back. So it really needs to be a commitment when people like really want to do the work, then they, they do look deeper in the surface, but it's, it's, we have to make people where they're at. If someone only wants to come in and work on the symptoms, cause that's all they can handle right now. And maybe it's because it's COVID time and they're home with their family 24 seven and they really don't have the time or the space to process, then we meet them where they're at. So I don't think it's a clear cut cookie cutter answer by any means. I think you got to go with what you have and what people are willing to do. And support them in the best way we can. Well, I'm smiling because you, 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 every every other every few shows I get somebody to say it about this not a cookie cut, cutter answer. You come to the wrong place if you're looking for cookie cutter questions. This is difficult conversation, so I'm going to hit you with tough questions like that. So, right on, bravo for that, Masi. Uh, John has a good one that I think you'll both like. Clinicians need to be paid more. Don't suppose there's a disagreement there from either one of you, right? Not nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Kevin wants to know, do you think that we over medicate? Meg, what do you think? Yes. <laughs> I don't even have, uh, I, yes. In my experience, I see an over prescription of psychiatric medication. And that may be because I'm also a licensed drug and alcohol counselor and I'm coming from that, you know, that area as well. Um, but yes, I, I see, I see it often. All right. Fair enough. Masi does. I'm, I was actually, I'm not going to, I don't necessarily think we over medicate. I don't think we always correctly medicate. Ooh, okay. People go in there and they don't talk about their true symptoms. So like, Oftentimes, anxiety and ADHD are confused. So if we're not giving the prescription, and I'm not a prescriber, and I know Meg's not a prescriber either, but if people aren't giving the correct information, they're not getting the correct medication. And then sometimes there's another medication to counteract that medication. So lots of people are going to their PCPs for medication right now because that's where they can get an appointment, and I would 100% refer there, but they're not psychiatrists. They're not trained as such. So again, we only can get deal with what we get Psychiatrists and other prescribers are only can only medicate what information they're given. That's all right. Great point. So I have a question that's based off of this question. Does medication lessen the load or make the load more manageable for you as providers? Meg. No. <laughs> no? No. Um, no, I, you know, in in my experience, I medication has the potential to actually add to our load because when people take medication in hopes of alleviating you know the symptoms that they're dealing with they fail sometimes to realize that 
the side effects of medication can bring about a whole new set of symptoms. And so then you're kind of dealing with and trying to navigate that. And as since I'm not a prescriber, um, it, it's, you know, challenging to to kind of work through that with a client because mm -hmm. I, I, that's not my area of expertise. Um, but, you know, also, it you know, science shows that exercise, proper exercise, nutrition and sleep is the most effective treatment for a lot of mental health related issues. I'm not speaking about things like schizophrenia and, and you know, that level of severe mental illness, but I'm talking about anxiety, depression, ADHD, you know, all of those things, the most effective treatment has shown to be exercise, sleep, and nutrition. All right. Masa, you want in on this? What I was going to say is that I, I think that medication alleviates some of the symptoms. It brings you down a notch so that way you can function, but it doesn't, it doesn't fix the root of the problem. It doesn't teach you coping skills. And lots of times clients will come in and they'll take medication and they'll feel better and then they'll disappear from therapy and they haven't done the work. So it's, it's a band aid, and it's, and it's certainly helpful in a lot of ways to get people to function, get you out of bed, get you to school, get you to focus, but it doesn't fix the problem by any means. So let me ask you, how do you hold clients accountable? Cause I'm sure that, you know, part of the lessons, part of the, the whole treatment process is accountability, self accountability, and making sure they're hitting their check marks along the way. So how do you, you know, what are some of the strategies you use to hold people accountable, Meg? Well, I, my style is kind of to just call it like it is. Um, if, you know, and, and saying, you know, well, if you keep repeating this dynamic or this, you know, this behavior, nothing's going to change. Um, but, you know, it's really difficult because you have to obviously be at a point that you have the relationship that you can say those things to somebody mm -hmm. and have it receive. But also, you know, we can't force clients to to follow through on things that we discuss within, a, you know, a 45 minute session. And we see them only, you know, once a week or every other week. It's really challenging in that way to 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 hold anyone accountable. All right, Meg. I mean, it's going to be Masi. I mean, we can't do the work for them. I think a lot of people think that, you know, that they're, everything changes in the 45 to hour a minute session. And the reality is most of the work is done outside of the session. We give you some tools. We give you some things to think about, but you need to do the work outside of it. And so people come in and they haven't done the work. I ask them, you know, the why would, you know, why same thing as Meg, like, why would you expect things to change? You know, it's not, I can't change it for you. Kind of, you know, what 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 is their internal, what is their accountability? What's their internal internal motivation? You know, why do they keep showing up week after week if they are not willing to do the work? The whole definition of insanity is continuing to do the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, that sounds like this is right in, in line with that uh, mode of thinking. So from there, let's try to go, let's try to go to something positive here. What does it feel like? when you've worked with a client for a long time and you're starting to see them turn a corner? Like, is that something that happens often? Is that what gets you up in the morning? So Meg, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, that is, I mean, that's why we do what we do because, you know, those moments when, when you see a client come to the realization or even just the self-discovery um, that, that we witness is, so rewarding and then you know observing them able to then take control of their lives through taking control of their emotions is is huge Masi? yeah i mean when you when you watch someone's transformation of any magnitude it's it's amazing to be a part of the process because they they you know they've allowed us to come into their lives they're the ones doing the work they're the ones who are doing the vulnerability um you know, it's, we, we often get the, oh my gosh, I need you help, help text, but to wake up and get a, a text from a client that says, Hey, I rocked this, or I did this. And I wanted to share this with you because you've been there. 
It's just, it's, it's really a testament to the relationship. So when someone comes in and, and shares their life with you, session after session, you know you're doing something because they keep coming. That's a, that's amazing. That that is an amazing uh, feeling. Uh, I mean, just listening to the both of you, I mean, I asked a question and instantly, I mean, Meg Meg sat up and you lit right up like uh, <laughs> like Christmas morning. You get that shiny new bike under the tree. So that was um, that that's that's a great answer. And that that makes me feel good even even hearing that. Uh, response from both of you. So thank you both for, for that and, and, and for being there for people. So we're getting down the last few minutes here. List. What list, let's say a top three list of coping mechanisms would you like to recommend for people that may be feeling like, you know, things are swinging the way to they might to the point where they might need your services. So uh, Meg, any, any top three list? I would say that my the, the staples of my list for prevention and maintenance is get out and move, nourish your body, and recharge. All right. Masi, you want to add to the list? Um, you know, we certainly use those, um, but also like find things that are, if, if your head's spinning, you want to just, you want to ground yourself. You want to find things that are real around you, things that you can touch, things that you can see. Um, things to kind of really just to bring you back, bring you back to reality. Outstanding. All right. Flip side of that. So we have a list of coping mechanisms. So there's a lot of parents out there that are watching this live and I appreciate that, but there's going to be a lot more people that are going to check out the replays. What would you give another list? Top three things that people, parents, family members, loved ones should be looking out for for these problems that are starting to bubble over and manifest themselves. What should we be looking at? Uh, those of us that aren't trained in this. You know, anything that's different than the norm. If your child or loved one is usually bubbly and talkative and they're not, that's a warning sign. If they're usually quiet and, and then they're all of a sudden they're talkative, that's a warning sign. So for me, anything that's different than what's normal for the person that you care about is really, you know, a huge warning sign. But also, you know, anytime I think people, there's a stigma that, and I may be opening a can of worms here, but there's a stigma that you need to have something wrong to be able to go talk to somebody. So if someone is asking to talk, I would honor that. It doesn't matter if something is, is wrong or they just want a place that's their own just to go share, to have someone who's non judgmental and can listen to them. So there's, everybody can use therapy. doesn't matter if things are are really bad or you're suffering from a diagnosis or you just want a space of your own. You know, it's, it's, everybody can use it. All right. Meg, what say you? I think that definitely increased irritability and, you know, conflict. Um, oftentimes people respond with irritability and, and aggression when they're struggling. Um, definitely watch for a loss of interest in, you know, activities that were once preferred or enjoyed. And in any drastic changes in eating, sleeping, and activity level, those are kind of the basic. All right. That sounds wonderful. What do you have going on, Masi? How can people follow you? How can people be involved in, in, uh, in, in just increasing awareness of mental health issues and the importance of what's going on in the world? I think reading as much as possible, asking questions, you know, using your resources. There's there's people around you who always, you know, can always available to talk to, and somebody knows somebody. Um, I think just kind of getting out there. You know, social media can sometimes take you down the rabbit hole, but it also there's a lot of good mental health websites on there that you can check out or support groups online. Um, I think just kind of make yourself as aware as possible and ask the questions. All right. Now, let me ask you real quick while I have you, do you have links to any of this? Because I know what in today's world, um, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear about, like you said, links, like links online, places to go. How do people know when they go into the real deal and they don't end up sharing information or something with something that might not be legit? Like as far as seeing a therapist? Well, you said that there's a lot of links and in, 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 in online and places to get information from. Like, how do you... Like, again, I don't know anything about this. Like, how would I know that I'm going to a reputable source? 
like, do you have links on your web? Like, can I go to like your, your be inspired website? And do you have links to so the, we have things on our Facebook page. We post links of things that we have researched and that we, you know, are comfortable sharing. We don't post anything that we're not comfortable sharing. Um, but also I think it's, it's like anything you have to, if it speaks to you, it's probably helpful. I wouldn't take necessarily a social media article as therapy by any means, but as a tool to get some information to kind of fuel something in you and maybe have you ask more questions or ask other questions. Outstanding. And one more time, let people know how they can find you and follow you on social media. So um, we're at beinspiredcounseling.com um, and on social media, Be Inspired Counseling LLC. We have a picture of a daffodil is our logo. So that's how you'll know it's us. Um, and we're posting articles and resource materials and just food for thought all the time. And if anybody has any questions or if we'd be a good fit for them or, you know, we have a workshop coming up, they can reach us. Um, our main office is 508-930-0154. Outstanding. Meg, how I can we find have... out, how can we support your mission and how can we learn more about you? So my website is mkwellnessllc.org. Um, and I have, it's under, it, the downloads page is under construction, so I will preface that. However, there is a vir my virtual office, which I believe is up and running, where um, you know you can click on various objects that are in the office, and it will bring you to either an article or a coping skill or some sort of resource to help with emotional management. So that. Um, that might be useful for some people. And, and I think it's kind of fun to play around with. So that is definitely something I would suggest checking out. And I also have a contact form on my website, which people can fill out and um, it gets sent to me and, and if they're seeking services. And then I can either, you know, offer them some resources if I'm not able to take them um, and point them in the right direction. Outstanding. And you also have a Facebook page. Are you on Instagram or any of that? Say LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm on all sorts of social media and the links to those are on my website. Outstanding. Ladies, thank you so much for taking the time away from your families to join us tonight on, on such an important issue. It's just something that, uh, that I think a lot of people want more information about. I think a lot of people are interested in, but quite frankly, there's, there's kind of a, an unfair uh, negative stigma attached to this sometimes. And, and there might be a little bit of embarrassment to reaching out about this. And you have certainly um, done a lot to shed that, you know, like you've changed, you've, you've educated me. I've learned a lot. Hopefully people that are, that are uh, watching live and so that are going to catch the replays, they're also going to learn from this. And this should be just the beginning of making people view uh, the mental health industry maybe a little differently. Well, thank you for having us. And thank you for everything you do in law enforcement as well. No, oh, I, I appreciate that. And, um, it, it really makes me feel uh, feel great that I can provide a safe space for people to have these difficult conversations. Uh, Meg, by the way, your sweatshirt is awesome, by the way. Yes. I didn't... <laughs> So that's going to do it for, for us tonight, folks. Again, this has been Difficult Conversations by Supply the Why. Check us out on all the local so on all the social media. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen there. Please like, subscribe, and share this show and any of our other content if it moves you in a certain way. So we'll catch you all next week on uh, another episode of Difficult Conversations. And as always, remember, hashtag Supply the Why. Good night, everybody. <laughs>